Thank you for the positive feedback on last week's stories about female aviators, Princess Anne Lowenstein and the Honorable Elsie McKay. I'm bringing you a couple more this week because as I read more about these ladies of the air, I'm fascinated by their lives and their courage in wanting to break some boundaries. This week, we're going to look at two young women from even earlier, the 1910s, Harriet Quimby and Blanche Stewart Scott. Harriet Quimby enters our story as a journalist who wrote stories for publications like Leslie's Weekly. May 1911. She's making daily flights in an aviation school in New York called the Moissant School in order to attempt to get her pilot's license. She also drives and thinks that flying is not any more dangerous than driving a high-powered vehicle. It's July 1911, and the Harvard Aeronautical Society is hosting a summer meet in Cambridge, Massachusetts. One of the women participating is Miss Harriet Quimby from New York, born in California, who at this point has still been working as a journalist. She's planning to fly her own plane at this meet, which is a monoplane. It's August 1911. Harry has become the first American woman to be given a license as a qualified air pilot by the Aero Club of America. To earn her license, she had to complete five figure eights, which she did at a height of 150 feet. She landed in a specified area, stopping within seven feet and nine inches of the mark, which according to the New York Telegraph was a world record for landing at that time. She flew back up into the air, completed the remaining figure eights, turning first to right and left and landing on her descent at the 124 foot mark. She then went up to test for altitude, which calls for a height of 164 feet. She reached over 200 feet, came down in a large circle before landing. She made another ascent and rose to an altitude of 250 feet. She said, quote, flying is easy for a woman. It's no harder than driving an automobile. If you know just how. I know because I have driven a car for six years. It is a great deal more fun to sail through the air than it is to wheel over the ground. Only when flying near the earth comes the realization of speed. Once up among the clouds, the sensation is one of drifting. I have had but one accident, and that was in the school machine. Running along the ground, I struck a rut and crippled the chassis. I bet no man has a better record than that. I work hard for my degree. I got up at 4 o'clock every morning and took my lessons, giving myself time to get to the city in time for business. These tests are pretty severe. The aviator is required to perform two uninterrupted series of figure eights. This is considered one of the most difficult feats in flying as it calls for both right and left turns. The figure eights are flown around two posts about 1,600 feet apart. In addition, you must land within 164 feet of a designated point." September 2, 1911. In her Moissant monoplane, she flew for five miles at a mile a minute with an average altitude of 300 feet. September 27, 1911. At the Long Island Flying Grounds, Harriet and a fellow flyer, Matilda Moissant, decided to take cross-country flights, each in her own monoplane. Before starting, Miss Quimby called to Miss Moissant, Where shall we go? Follow me, was the reply. I don't think they went across the entire country. They seem to have stayed in the general New York State area. But I guess it was something not seen before, two females each in their own planes and flying together. The Bridgeton Pioneer, September 28, 1911. Quote, but the bird-like Blériot, which is a monoplane, the fastest aircraft known and the most graceful in the air is practically unknown. It requires greater skill to handle the monoplane than the biplane. The chances are danger are said to be greater, all of which stamps Miss Quimby as a wonder of skill and courage. It is said that she has a natural instinct for the game, and her flights up to the present time have won for her the name of being the most interesting of all who have conquered the air. End quote. October 2nd, 1911. Harriet was asked by a reporter about the danger of flying. Quote, oh, there's danger everywhere. The walker is in as much danger almost as the flyer. Did you never hear about the fate of Jorkins? Jorkins, poor fellow, came from the country to New York. The noise and confusion of New York quite upset him. Threading his way across the busy street, he thought he would go mad. Clank, clank! Jorkins leaped to the right just in time to escape a motor car. Ding-a-ling, ding-dong! He darted to the left from under the very wheels of an automobile fire engine. Hmm! Jorkins, looking up in the air, now saw a monoplane, its tail smashed, falling straight upon him. He glared wildly around, caught sight of a manhole, 
lifted the cover and jumped down into a black hole just in time to be cut in half by an underground electric train. End quote. January 3rd, 1912. Harriet flew to Mexico and has returned. Apparently, she was shot at by a local who probably thought she was an enormous bird of prey. Well, some of the lady aviators are getting scrappy with some trash talk. Blanche Scott, who not so coincidentally we'll be talking about next, does not have a pilot's license, but has said that Harriet and Matilda Mossant, who both have theirs, are too afraid to compete with her because she, quote, was too daring and spectacular, end quote, for them. Harriet, on hearing this, said, quote, of course she must understand that Miss Blanche Scott has never been awarded a license by the International Aero Club. Under these circumstances, it is impossible for me, who has been awarded a license, to challenge her. Otherwise, I should not hesitate to challenge Miss Scott. Besides, this Miss Scott cannot do the right-hand turn. That is one of the hardest things to do and necessitates a spiral glide. I can do it. The idea of Miss Scott saying that I am afraid to compete with her is too ridiculous to talk about. I'm not afraid of her, nor of any man. Why, if I had the same power airplane as Claude Graham White, I should not hesitate to challenge him for a race. I don't believe in this circus flying, but I'm certainly not afraid of Miss Scott. Now, if only she were properly licensed, I should. But what is the use of talking? She is not licensed. End quote. Now, ladies. April 16th, 1912. Harriet is the first woman to cross the English Channel solo in an aeroplane, landing in Hardolo, France. Supposedly, the flight took about two hours. Allegedly, she hid her identity, calling herself Miss Griffith while in England and Madame Alfier while in France. Due to the dangers of this crossing between the wind and the fog, she didn't want to try it publicly and then fail. Only two female friends and about six men knew her plans. It was believed that she flew this crossing at an altitude of 6,000 feet, which could be a record for women, and was guided only by a compass, which she had never used before. Quote, directly I took my seat in the Blario. I knew I would be all right. She was a beauty. I felt perfectly at home. I set my course over Dover Castle and had my first surprise in a few minutes. When the machine rose, everything was beautifully still and calm. But once over the castle, we ran into the most exciting, gusty winds. But I was up and away over the channel before they had time to do me any harm. And then it was hi-ho and me for Calais as hard as I could pelt. The channel, no doubt, looked very fine, but I was not for admiring the view just then. I let the Blario go for all she was worth, and then slap bang, I hit a fog bank head on. In about 10 seconds, I hadn't the remotest idea where I was. I just couldn't go blundering on through that horrible fog. So I sent the Blario up until I was about 2,000 feet. Below me, land suddenly appeared. On the left, I saw a town standing out, and I took this to be Calais. So I swung off promptly to the right, comfortably thinking that I should strike the flying ground all right. There were the most beautiful green fields below me. But they looked nice and compact and so well laid out that I simply couldn't come down on them and tear them up. So I cut back and finally landed on the beach. The place turned out to be a little fishing village. I had safely climbed out of the machine and was congratulating myself in a self-satisfied way. Whenever over the top of the beach, here came suddenly a host of the quaintest figures, each carrying, as I subsequently discovered, a pail full of worms. They all stopped short about 20 yards away, and we respectfully admired each other for some minutes. Then we both started to speak at once. After a bit, I gathered that they, they were all fishermen, were hailing me as the first woman to fly the channel. It was very, very nice of them, but what I wanted most was to send a telegram off to my mother, telling her of my safe arrival, End quote. Apparently, the fishermen carried her off of the beach. Not sure if that was out of celebration or so they could get back to their fishing. July 2nd, 1912. But sometimes good things come to an end, and in this case, in a really horrific way. Harriet was at a Boston aviation meet and was in an airplane with her passenger, W.A. Willard, who was the manager of this aviation meet. Harriet and Willard were returning from a venture over Boston Harbor, some 20 miles out, and were coming back over Dorchester Bay. She was volplaning, which is a controlled dive or downward flight at a steep angle, with the engine shut off. But allegedly, her angle was too sharp. A gust of wind caught the tail and tipped the tail vertical. Others say that a controlling wire broke when she started to volplane. At such an angle, Willard was thrown forward out of the plane. Harriet shortly followed. They fell approximately a thousand feet and landed in the water about 20 feet from the shore, where the water was at low tide and so pretty shallow. 
The monoplane came down in the water, only about 15 feet away from them, entering gracefully, but the nose hit the mud and the plane flipped over onto its back. People boating in the water rushed over to rescue them, but it was thought that death was probably instant. I'm not going to get into the details, but I think you can imagine what a fall like that could do to a body. The plane was recovered and was largely undamaged except for broken struts and wires. Mathilde Mossant, friend to Harriet and a fellow aviator, would end her flying career. Having already lost her brother to a flying incident, the death of Harriet seemed to seal the deal for her, although another newspaper account said that she had already quit prior to this particular accident. But for the most part, this tragic accident, one of many during the early years of aviation, it did not keep many from pushing forward. It was Miss Quimby's oft-repeated statement that, quote, happy people all belong to the same generation, end quote, and she did everything she could to make people happy. She was as cheerful as can be, and in a letter which she posted on her way to the aerodrome the day she met her death, she laughingly quotes Omar to show how little she fears that anything will happen to her, and yet how she refuses to take herself seriously. The quotation, which evidently answered some entreaty to be careful, told how improbable it was, quote, that youth's sweet-scented manuscript should close, end quote. Miss Quimby's ambition was to earn enough money before she was 35 so that she might retire from daily work to write one big book or one big play. The residents of Hardelot, the fashionable French resort on the English Channel, had presented her with a bungalow and a large piece of ground for her cross-channel flight. She wanted to go there in the summer when she retired from business affairs and to live her winters in Southern California where she owned an orange ranch. But the risk of adventure was too much. Pensacola Journal, February 1917. As with aviation, so with science, skill, industry, business. Everything bigger, better, greater than ever before. Will the exploits of today be considered as trivial 10 years from now as those of 10 years ago are today? Our next story is about Blanche Stewart Scott. You know, the one trash talking Harriet by saying Harriet was too afraid to compete against her. Well, Blanche was also a witness to Harriet's tragic death, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Personally, I like the banter. It brings a desire to do more and better. Blanche originally found herself in the news first 1910, not for flying airplanes, but for driving. It's late May 1910. Blanche plans to take the 5,000 plus mile cross country trip in an automobile called the Model 38 Overland. She'll be accompanied by a woman, but will be doing all of the driving. She is required also to make any repairs herself. She is prepared for this trip with spare tires, repair kits, camping gear, extra spark plugs, and a gun. When asked what she'll do if she breaks down in the middle of nowhere, quote, why fix it, of course. I don't expect any serious troubles. My car is so simple and trouble-free that I'm not afraid of any very difficult repairs being necessary. If men can make the trip successfully, why can't women? I don't expect to break any speed records. I intend to take my time and enjoy the outing as much as possible. Men are skeptical of a woman's ability to cope with anything mechanical, and I'm going to prove the contrary. I don't see why it is that everybody seems to think this is such a great undertaking. I don't consider it as anything more than an extended vacation. There will be an occasional puncture to mend or a spark plug to clean, but but what is there hard about that? Hardships? Well, this is a civilized country and I have nothing to fear in that line but storms and bad roads. Storms can't be helped and if anyone can show me a road my car can't negotiate, it isn't a road. End quote. So how did this start? A $1,000 bet between the sales manager at Willie's Overland and the Kansas City Overland representative. Blanche will go from Albany, New York to Buffalo, Chicago to Omaha, following the Platte Valley and Overland through Cheyenne, Ogden, Reno, Sacramento, and Oakland to San Francisco. She has to depend on her own resources, repairs, and supplies. She started off carrying a sealed message from Mayor Gaynor of Greater New York for her to give to Mayor McCarthy in San Francisco. She also has a bottle of water from the Atlantic Ocean that she will pour into the Pacific Ocean. The trip as of June 3rd has been uneventful. This is not a race to get there. Not a speed record, not an endurance record. She's just trying to show that a woman can drive a car across the country as well as a man. 
Her round has been arranged so that every night she will be in a town with hotel accommodations. She's shooting for about 150 miles a day, but again, not for speed or endurance records. Quote, it is more pleasant driving an automobile across country than pouring tea in an afternoon reception. At least, that's the way I feel about it. End quote. July 24th, 1910. She and her travel companion had made their way into San Francisco, receiving quite the welcome. During the trip, they went without hats and have developed quite the tan faces. They had an enjoyable trip. Every time they reached a place where they had been previously told they, they would encounter issues, they found the car could easily traverse those difficult spots except for the Kingsbury grade as they were coming over the Sierra Nevadas. It took four hours to cover 12 miles. Miss Phillips, her traveling companion, walked it, except for the last three-fourths of a mile, where she hitched a ride on a load of hay. Now, Blanche, depending on who you talk to, was said to be the first woman to fly a plane. She was attending the Curtis Flying School and was practicing taxiing when something lifted the plane and she flew for about 40 feet before she was able to gently land. Whether this flying was intentional or not, the early birds of aviation gave her the credit of being the first woman to fly a plane in the U.S. Others would say that Bessica Reich, a mere 10 days later, would be given that credit. July 25, 1911, taking up a biplane, she flew across 12 miles of land in 10 minutes, actually overtaking another aviator who had started first. She returned to her originating point and landed safely. January 19, 1912, she's gained the reputation from fellow aviators to be the nerviest woman in the business. She was participating in an exhibition when an aviator from China fell 150 feet, but thankfully was okay. She witnessed the accident, but a few minutes later was up in the sky herself. January 26, 1912. I prefer drowning to being killed by a fall from a flying machine. I object to a demise that spills you. The looks of the thing. Ugh. And still you fly? She was asked. Quote, but I can't come to harm that way. I was made to drown. How? I can't say. I became interested in aviation while Curtis was at Imperial Beach. I went down to see his machines and someone wired east that I had gone up with him when I hadn't. After that, everybody said I ought to aviate, so I tried, and here I am. I have always flown alone except once when I went up as Curtis's guest. Am I scared? Well, rather. That is before I go up. Lots of times I have a regular nervous chill, but why don't I try a bracer? <laughs> no thank you. I knew a man who tried that. He is dead. After I start, I get over my fright. I'm of an extremely nervous temperament, and flying calms my nerves. It uses up my surplus nervous energy. Nope, I haven't any ambition in the altitude line. 1,000 feet satisfies me. My ambition is for distance. As to speed, I've made 70 miles an hour, and that also satisfies me. Among women, I think Miss Matilda Moissant will hold the altitude record. My mother thinks my profession is simply awful. She considers flying like circus riding. For her sake, I made an honest effort to quit and couldn't. That confirmed her in the circus theory. I had an offer to navigate submarines, but was afraid to take it. The reporter asked, Afraid of submarine after flying? She was asked. But I am destined to be drowned. I am going to Argentina after I finish at the meet in Los Angeles. Going after the prizes and the exhibition work, that is where the money is. End quote. July 2nd, 1912. July 1st is the day that Harriet Quimby was killed. When this happened, Blanche was flying high above Harriet in her own plane during an exhibition flight, flying for the crowd as Harriet had gone out over the water and was just now returning in. When Blanche saw the horrific accident, she allegedly almost lost control of her plane, recovered herself, managed to land after a few tries, and collapsed. When asked if she would continue at this meet in Boston, she said, quote, I will fulfill my contract to fly during the remainder of the week. Although yesterday's accident was horrible and for a time unnerved me, I will not give up flying, End quote. She was asked in October 1912 about how she became an aviator. Quote, it was simply wished on me. Even as a youngster, I had a streak of wild adventure, loving spirit, and my makeup, which the psychologist, always hunting for causes, motives, or inherited tendencies, will probably trace back to my great-great-great-grandfather, who, as a pirate, stormed the seas under the fearsome sobriquet of Black Jack, end quote. After detailing some of her childhood interests and dangerous feats, and later with the rush of speeding, 
friends told her, quote, I suppose the next thing you'll do will be to go up in an aeroplane, end quote. And I heard this so often that I attribute the real cause of my first flight to the power of suggestion, end quote. November 6, 1913, quote, so long as I have strength to guide a machine, I will continue flying, end quote. She'd had an accident flight where she broke her shoulder the previous summer. Some thought this would end her career, but nope. As far as I know, Blanche continued flying for a time and continued with aviation in some form or another even after that. In 1953, she was in Washington at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum to attend an International Air Pioneers Dinner, which was also attended by President Eisenhower. Blanche would live until 84 years old, and in 1980, the USPS would issue a stamp with her picture on it. Fascinating the real chutzpah of these women to do something that not only few of their gender had ever done, but of any gender, to be honest. I admire anyone's courage to do something risk-taking because they wanted to see if they could to forward science and aviation. So next week, we're back to a story that will throw you for a loop. Not to worry, we're back on terra firma, but this one will have you wondering if you should take some notes. Thanks again, everyone. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I sincerely enjoy bringing you these stories. I'm learning so much myself and there's so much more out there. See you.